So Jules, welcome back to Rebel Wisdom. Thank you, David. So you'll be familiar to a lot of uh, our viewers as a philosopher and journalist. And I see you as someone who you're, you're, you're an academic, you're very well steeped in philosophy and the history of ideas, but you bring that to bear on cultural topics. I'd love it if you kind of describe what you consider your work to be about rather than me summarize it. Sure. Well, um, the principal thing I'm interested in is um, ideas and how they can make our life better and worse. Um, the way I got into philosophy was uh, I had bad anxiety uh, in my late teens and early 20s because of uh, reckless drug taking as a teenager. And um, what really helped me was um, ancient Greek philosophy and particularly Stoicism. And the idea at the heart of Stoicism, similar to what you find in Buddhism and other traditions, is that our suffering is caused by beliefs. So uh, your beliefs, your opinions, your attitude, your philosophy, conscious or unconscious, shapes your reality, uh, including your emotional reality. And um, I was helped also by cognitive behavioral therapy, which comes from ancient Greek philosophy and teaches you to examine your unexamined beliefs and opinions and see if they are wise, coherent, evidence-based, or if they're causing you unnecessary suffering. Um, so I guess it, the first thing is that the power of ideas, good and bad, to, 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 to really either enhance your life and your society or to really um, poison your life and your relationships and your society. The other thing that I really got from that experience of being helped by cognitive therapy and then thinking, oh, this comes from some men in togas from 300 BC was a fascination with the, the history, the archeology span of contemporary ideas. Um, so I, I, I'm just, yeah, the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the water we swim in of contemporary culture, it all has a history. A lot of what we assume is kind of natural and obvious and inevitable was actually kind of invented at a certain time and, and then mutated in certain ways. And that fascinates me. Another example, um, I'm fascinated with our, I, I wrote, a, my second book was about the history and our contemporary attitudes to ecstatic experiences how Western culture um, became, you know, got a very suspicious and kind of pathological attitude towards ecstatic experiences, contrary to most other societies in the world. But then how since the 60s and in different ways, we've come to a much more eager, uh, open attitude to the ecstatic and how figures like Aldous Huxley, for example, helped to shape our cultural attitude to say psychedelics. So, those are the two things, really, the power of ideas uh, and for, for everyone, the idea that we are all philosophers. This isn't just an academic thing. Everyone has a philosophy, whether they're conscious of it or not, that shapes their reality. Secondly, everyone has the power to change their philosophy, which is the equivalent to changing their identity and to changing their reality by changing the belief through which they view what happens to them. And that can be extremely therapeutic. And thirdly, I just love the value of the history, uh, of the history of ideas. And I think since I was a teenager, I've loved building a, a map of the history of ideas and seeing how ideas mutate and evolve over time. And seeing like, for example, how contemporary disputes today over identity or rights or meaning have long tales, have long histories, uh, and and um, and we shouldn't be intimidated by the history of ideas. I mean, so my first book, Philosophy for Life, I kind of I say, there's a famous painting of by Raphael in the Vatican called the School of Athens, and it shows this imaginary street gathering of some of the great philosophers of the ancient world. And I say, imagine being invited to that school and being part of that conversation with. Epictetus and Socrates and Aristotle and so forth. And I'm a big believer in the accessibility of these great ideas, that this is all of our birthright, all of our inheritance and legacy. Uh, 
I didn't study philosophy at university. I did English literature. So, that, you know, this was, I'm, I'm a big believer in autodidacticism as well and adult education. We can enrich our inner lives and our conversations by not being intimidated by the big names. Uh, the, the, you, they, they have stuff to tell us and they are, they are beautiful to read. Yeah, and the reason we're talking now is that you are shortly in a week or two going to be doing a course with us which is going to be looking at these some of these big ideas some of these big thinkers and applying them to current topics and we're going to kind of go through a little bit of that here because i think it's a really really fascinating idea that you've got it's looking at identity politics and authenticity uh rights free speech and cancel culture um the new religion of wellness truth myth and conspirituality and nature existential risk and transhumanism so there's lots of really big topics and we'll dive into those and do a little bit of a kind of intro to them in a second. But something you said before was that if we're not careful, we can all become the mouthpiece of a, of a dead philosopher. This idea that we are either consciously or unconsciously, our, our, our inner lives are only partially our own because a lot of the ideas that we have, they're inherited and it is, is some sense of what you're trying to do to to get us to be more conscious of of kind of the grammar and the thinking that we're actually kind of playing out maybe unconsciously um absolutely 100 percent um there's also this idea of the value of a broad map of ideas and the value of having a what, what people sometimes call a hinterland which is like if you think of your inner life, that it's not a narrow bungalow, that it's got plenty of space, you know, you, you, you put effort into building it out, including in terms of your ideas furniture. And, and I think one value of that is that you're less likely to be possessed by any particular idea, taken over by it. What we're seeing at the moment is people grappling to make sense of complex, chaotic times. And they're grappling to build a map of meaning. But sometimes they're in that search, just getting very hooked on the, the one person they happen to read. So just completely hooked on, say, Ken Wilber, or uh, on um, you know critical race theory, or on Jordan Peterson, and seeing everything through that lens. And, and this person is, or this idea is the gospel. It becomes a kind of, you know, that, uh, religious, uh, a dogma. Um, rather than seeing, okay, this person has some good ideas, but it, they're not, you know, they're not God, as it were. I mean, they're, 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 every philosophy has some value and some flaws. When you get possessed by a particular kind of um, ideology or agenda or philosophy, then it, it, it leads to things like polarization and, and just to an impoverishment of your experience and your worldview, because you're seeing things in very black and white. So that's why there's a value in learning to consider different ideas, their history, that these are long arguments where, you know, people have put forward ideas. Every great philosopher uh, has strengths and weaknesses. Um, none of them are perfect. None of them are, are, are infallible. Um, and that just that just gives one a certain kind of cognitive liberty not to be completely hijacked by a particular idea uh, and a kind of epistemic flexibility as well to appreciate, um, you know, the, the strengths and possible weaknesses in your own philosophy, because your philosophy is going to have flaws. So that gives you room to grow, but also to see the strengths and weaknesses in your your friends or your interlocutors arguments so you can see i can appreciate that where they're coming from or this point of view or that point of view but here are the possible flaws in it so it's just it's it's partly about becoming less polarized less rigid and and fixed it's a kind of yoga for the mind uh that you're you're, you're less just uh, ossified in a certain attitude and maybe let's dig into a few of the specifics of the the subjects that you're going to be covering and maybe start with identity politics and authenticity is your sense that because identity politics you would imagine or most people would consider certainly is at a peak and most people would probably date it to maybe 10 20 years ago and the kind of rise of 
things like um, critical race theory. But is your sense that identity politics actually has a much longer history than that? Um, yeah, the kind of the search for who we really are and the idea that this is a fraught question um, goes back uh, at, you know, at least two millennia. And, and so this session starts off by looking at particularly kind of Socrates uh, and the Upanishads and the idea that we are not just our inherited beliefs, attitudes, our tribal identity, that somehow we've got to kind of think for ourselves. Uh, Socrates says, know thyself, learn to examine your unexamined assumptions. Uh, and this is a, a kind of destabilizing idea. Socrates is put to death for undermining faith in the traditional gods. But he's basically saying, go on this quest to discover the real you. And for these ancient philosophers, the real you is, is a kind of transcendent thing. It's an impersonal intelligence that you become one with. Um, then we're going to look at how that idea evolves and mutates in Christianity, where there's this search for the real you, but it's this passionate, emotional search. There's the old fallen David, who's kind of lost in sin, but then you have these rebirth experiences where you become born again in Christ um, and you are connected to your brothers and sisters in Christ, but you're surrounded by demonic enemies and you're in this kind of war, uh, both between the old you and the new you within your flesh and within society. And I guess what I'm interested in is how that religious idea of the, the search for the real you um, gets evolves in modernity, in secular narratives. So we'll look at Rousseau and romanticism and romantic nationalism, where there's this idea, Rousseau is the kind of father of the idea of just search for your authentic, unique self. But it's nothing to do with discovering God. It's just about all the interesting peculiarities of you and share everything in this confessional kind of proto-blogger way. Um, so, and he was also with this idea that in some ways you can be born again to a new identity through your nation, through becoming a citizen of the Republic, but you're surrounded by demonic enemies who you must resist. Um, and what I'm curious about is how contemporary identity movements still have some of that kind of tang of these older religious formulations of I was lost, now I'm found, uh, now I have my brothers and sisters in Christ, as it were, but we are surrounded by demonic enemies. Um, so I'm curious about how can we have in some ways a slightly less apocalyptic uh, conversation about identity, slightly less charged uh, and slightly less uh, just uh, fiercely emotionally fused. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people will recognize that, certainly that some identity movements have this kind of religious fervor to them and on, on both sides. And, and that seems to be something that, yeah, there's a sort of deep grammar, I guess, the deep grammar of, would you say that it's essentially a Christian narrative still? I think it, it when I look at something like... Um, gay pride and how it's become a national festival. I think it's, it, it, it seems very Christian to me. Um, the narrative of, uh, I finally discovered like the real me. I've finally been reborn as the real me. And this is now a kind of a celebration, a festival of, of, of agape, but there are these opponents to our, you know, who are trying to keep us in bondage, keep us in uh, Babylon. Um, that's not to denigrate it. It's just to kind of look at the, how, how, all the historical scripts get repurposed in modern culture. Um, so, yeah, and I suppose I'm, the questions I'm interested in discussing, and, you know, these are not to present answers. These are kind of to really to um, foster good discussions for the people on the course. Questions like, what do we have in common beyond our differences? And do we need some kind of transcendent idea beyond our tribal identities? You know, in, in Christianity or in Buddhism or in Greek philosophy, 
we are we have our differences of of gender or or tribe, um, but there is something transcendent to our you know uh, particular selves, and we meet there. We're connected there. We might not have that today. So, what do we have instead? Do we need something transcendent? Uh, is it perhaps the earth, or or is it perhaps our capacity to feel pain and suffer and but also joy? So we'll look at, you know, I'm interested in that. And I don't have a kind of set answer. I'm interested to hear what people think. And I suppose also, how can we, how can we navigate our multiple identities? Like we all have multiple identities. Uh, and how can we, can we have a kind of more open, spacious attitude to our different multiple identities? Or without getting kind of fixed in one aspect of our identities? Um, so th those are some of the questions we will discuss. So, I mean, the, the course is um, some teaching, but a lot of breakout rooms, a lot of room for people to share their own ideas. That's the kind of joy of philosophy in a way. It's, it's different from psychology where you say, what well, we found, this is the answer. It's more like these are the interesting questions and helping us to articulate our thoughts on it. Mm. Yeah, something you just said reminded me there was a fascinating conversation between John McWhorter and Coleman Hughes talking about identity politics. And John McWhorter was saying he's, he's an atheist, but he was acknowledging that Martin Luther King had a religious vision. And he, he was asking the question and kind of veering towards the answer that he thought a religious vision was needed, that you need a kind of, you need something beyond the self to be able to kind of unify. And his, his sort of question was whether you could actually do, whether you could transcend some of the divisions of, of identity politics without that religious vision. And his sort of sense was that, that maybe you did, but he kind of felt like he couldn't go there because he was an atheist. Yeah. The alternative uh, is that religion uh, just makes things worse, more fused, more like apocalyptic. I remember a piece by Mary Harrington in Unheard who said the arguments over gender now are reminiscent of, of the kind of arguments in the Reformation. Uh, is the host uh, fully the body of Jesus Christ or is it just a way for, or does it transfer into the body of Christ when it goes into your mouth? Or, and, and people, thousands of people died over these questions. They were considered existential questions of identity. Um, like you're not, we're not just disagreeing about this. This is a matter of life and death that out my right to exist as this kind of Protestant or this kind of Catholic. And it, it's, of course, thank God, we're not like the wars of religion now, uh, you know, in the 17th century where a third of the population of Germany died in these religious disputes. Um, but it still, it still is existential. It's like zero sum. If you disagree with my point of view, you're denying my right to exist, and therefore that's violence. So I'm curious as to whether we can take some of that existential charge out of it. Hmm. Yeah, and as you're saying, a lot of them are open questions, which is what the, the course is designed for. We, we're going to be putting people into pods so they can discuss with each other, and there's a very sort of yeah, the, the idea is that these are open questions that people can kind of develop their thinking by exploring in real time. But I, I absolutely, but kind of carefully and respectfully, because of course, I, you know, when it touches on our identity, that's triggering because that's, you know, my value, my worth, my, my dignity, my rights. So there's always this balance, like, and this, this takes us really to the free speech kind of question as well. These are, in a way, it's about exploring these issues somewhat dispassionately, but also respectfully, because there are real people at the end of these ideas. Uh, and these ideas are part of our identity. So, of, of course, we can't approach it completely dispassionately. Yeah, and you mentioned um, rights, free speech and cancel culture, which is the next session. Um, and which philosophers do you think are most relevant. I mean, free speech is something we've covered a lot on the channel. Um, people have very strong views on online, understandably. Um, there's all the problems with censorship on the big tech platforms. What do you think is kind of, if you were going to do an x-ray of that conversation, what are the 
who are the key thinkers that you think are kind of underneath the, the surface? We're going to look at one particular debate, fierce debate, uh, angry, violent debate in the, uh, in the late 18th century, which was called the Revolutionary Controversy. It was a pamphlet war about the French Revolution. It was particularly between, on the one side, um, Edmund Burke, who, though he was a, a, a Whig politician, put forward a kind of conservative point of view that the French Revolution was deeply dangerous because in their search for kind of an abstract uh, uh, principles like liberty and equality, and in their attempt to build a utopia of kind of new of justice, they were just sweeping away and destroying all the traditions of, in this case, the, the Ancien Régime in France, smashing all the statues, literally declaring year zero, doing away with the old calendar. And Burke says this is very dangerous. First of all, it's impious towards our ancestors, that we, you know, that the society is a contract between the living and the dead, he says. Uh, and we should have, we should approach the flaws of our ancestors very carefully, as if we're approaching the flaws of our, of our parents. You know, yes, they're imperfect, but we're also their children in a way. And that we need traditions and customs to help ground our identity and, and kind of give us uh, habits, moral habits. And if you take away those habits, he says, there's a risk the worst aspects of, of human identity will come out. The, the mob violence, uh, scapegoating, the lust for blood. So he gives a very interesting kind of defense of traditions and customs. On the other side, you have uh, Tom Paine, uh, the great liberal philosopher, um, you know, the, uh, the kind of a, a key thinker for kind of idea of natural rights. And he completely disagrees with Edmund Burke and says, society is not for the dead. It's not for our ancestors. It's for the living. Each generation should be free to decide from first principles what is just, what is good, and to reject their ancestors if, the, you know, uh, if they think they're um, they're wrong and and they're and they're, and, they're, and they, they they're unjust, so um, that's kind of we, we, it. It was described as the last great debate about the fundamentals of, of of British politics, and of course, it's very much takes us to today and these these uh, remarkably furious arguments over statues and who we honour from the past and. Should we try to kind of slowly reform institutions or dismantle them, the kind of pace of change? So um, that's one thing we're going to look at in this session. As far as free speech goes, then we're going to look at um, John Stuart Mill, uh, mid 19th century, kind of the greatest liberal philosopher, really, who um, and we're going to look at his book on liberty, the idea that we should be free to do whatever we want as long as it doesn't harm someone else and to say whatever we want and to think whatever we want. And we'll think about why Mill thought that was important for society, that we should basically protect the eccentrics, the oddballs, even if their opinions are often offensive, because that's how society advances. It advances through the eccentrics, the oddballs, the geniuses, who are often very annoying at the time, that's why Socrates gets put to death. That's why Jesus gets put to death. And of course, that gets the nub of some of these arguments around free speech today. What is hate speech? If I say there's a difference between biological women and trans women, is that hate speech? A university professor was just forced to resign for making that statement because the, the suggestion was this made her university unsafe. So um, we will look at that. And then um, we will look at um, some of the tone in which free, uh, some of these debates uh, happen at the moment. And we're going to look a little bit at René Girard and his theory of um, scapegoating. Um, a lot of the theme of the course is about how we're slightly less rational than we think we are. And we're more religious than we think we are, that we are not this post-religious society. Um, that we build new philosophies and then we invest them with a great deal of, of emotion uh, and, uh, and they become almost kind of myths to us. Um, 
And Girard thought that the power of Christianity was it gave us this symbolic scapegoat in Jesus um, who, who dies for us. And uh, this, this was kind of basically changing the script of a human society, which for millennia had used literal scapegoats, had used human sacrifices in some way or other, kind of as a way to purge society of its discontent. And Girard says, if we move beyond Christian society, there's a risk we go back to the more primitive mode of scapegoating, where, you know, every week on, on Twitter, there's a new scapegoat and a new kind of exuberant mob shaming Let's destroy this person. Let, you know, let's end them uh, and until the next week and there's someone else. So there's something about how, and it goes back to what Burke was saying, some of these primitive impulses uh, can come out again in modern forms. Yeah, and you also decided uh, to cover wellness culture. What's the, what's the thinking there? Well, I've been writing about wellness um, for 20 years. I mean, my first blog was called like the politics of well-being. Um, and there's much that I love about it. Um, I, I, you know, therapy helped me a lot. Alternative therapies have helped me a lot. Um, in a way, like my great passion is try to give people ideas that help to heal them and make them kind of stronger and more flourishing. And we're going to look at a bit at, at that, how that has become a very dominant culture. We've really become a therapy culture and the historical roots of that um, in, for example, ancient Greek philosophy. And we'll look at philosophies like Stoicism and Epicureanism and how they inspired modern therapy, uh, as well as, um, you know, ecstatic approaches to, to therapy as well. So there'll be some kind of practical, useful advice there in terms of what our own kind of healing journeys. But I'm also interested in, you know, every religion has its flaws. Have we become over obsessed with wellness? Have we become over obsessed with sharing our feelings, sharing, you know, our, our vulnerabilities? Does that, when is that good for us? When does that make us more resilient? And when does that actually make us less resilient? If we're over monitoring our feelings, our happiness levels, if we're thinking, why aren't I happy? I should be happy. If it's turning us away from political solutions, always back to kind of inner solutions. So again, this is not a, a question where I have a clear, this is, this is the answer I want to present to you, but I'm exploring certain um, discomfort that I have with the triumph of the cult of wellness. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned the cult of wellness. So it's a quite a good segue into the next topic, which is truth, myth and conspirituality. And this is something that we've had you on the, the, the channel talking about a few times before, because it's and, and you did more than anyone possibly to popularize the word conspirituality. I know that you didn't kind of coin it in the first place, but you have covered it quite extensively. And I think we're very early to spot what was going on with the pandemic and how that has kind of accelerated so many of these topics that we're, that we're covering in this course and, and talking about. But this sense that a lot of wellness influencers early in the pandemic saw a big opportunity with, especially sort of QAnon style conspiracy, suddenly there was a big market for it. There were a lot of people who were very concerned, who were very, um, yeah, triggered. And our sort of threat detection system was on red alert because of the nature of the pandemic. And then suddenly this kind of conspirituality was accelerated. So what, what are you looking to cover in that section? Well, that's, I mean, in all these sessions, there'll be a kind of the contempt, we'll start off with a particular contemporary news story. So that might be the gathering of believers in QAnon. I think it was in, uh, in Florida and they expected JFK Jr. to appear, this, this, this long dead figure. Um, and then they kind of formed the shape of a Q on a lawn. Anyway, so it'll be some kind of contemporary story 
uh, in the news. Oh yeah, it was Dallas. Yeah, something like that. Whatever, whatever has been in the news that week, and then we'll dive deep into the to kind of the roots of it. And I'm interested there in the power of myth, and we're going to look at the ideas of like Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. Again, this idea that we're not quite as uh, rational as we think we are, and that we use mythical structures and mythical narratives to make sense of reality. Um, all of us do. Um, and uh, particularly in times of, of crisis and uncertainty, that our minds can look for kind of, because we know those kind of mythical narratives and they're satisfying to us. So sometimes we try to fix the ambiguous, messy complexity of modern society into um, mythical narratives. And that can be helpful. That can help us make sense of particularly kind of inward, inner processes, but also it can be tremendously galvanizing. A lot of utopian movements have used myths like, you know, the search for the promised land, the kingdom of heaven is coming. Um, but I think what we've seen in the pandemic is, is, is some of the toxic aspects of that. When people have taken all the complexity of like a, a, a pandemic and a public health crisis and looked for a narrative to make sense of it and then looked to a, 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 an old, quite basic myth. Uh, I, I, there's that there is an evil cabal who are, uh, who are trying, who have a grand plan and they're trying to, um, enslave us. Um, so, um, what we're also going to look at there is we're going to look at some of the psychology of like ecstatic experiences and the history of ecstatic experiences and how Western culture rather kind of marginalized ecstatic experiences in its attempt to be perfectly rational. Um, and I'm going to look at the philosopher um, and psychologist William James uh, and what, how he argued that actually there is a kind of benefit sometimes to ecstatic experiences. They can be healing. They can be empowering. But there's a risk to them as well in that you're switching off your critical thinking uh, and opening up to your kind of subconscious and to more like mythical, magical thinking. So... One of the key questions we're going to ask is how can we balance the ecstatic and the mythical with the more critical and the rational? How can we keep the benefits of enlightenment society, the commitment to critical thinking, rational thinking, scientific thinking, whilst also seeing the benefits of like the ecstatic and of our need for myths uh, to structure our reality? Um, so that's that's some of what we'll look at. And I, and I think, you know, how can we inject more of kind of critical thinking into spirituality as well? One of the challenges is that everyone thinks they're practicing critical thinking. Uh, conspiracy theorists think they're the, you know, the most critical thinking people. So um, it, it, it's not easy, but we'll look at some kind of basic tools of critical thinking that we can use to try and analyze our own beliefs. The final topic that you've putting together is nature, existential risk and transhumanism. So we've done an awful lot on the channel about what I think Jonathan Rowson calls the meta crisis. The idea that there are all of these different crises, existential risks that are sort of playing out in all of these different ways. Um, and the idea behind that is that they all have a sort of a single origin in the kinds of people that we are and the kinds of way of interacting with the world that I know John Babaki kind of nods to as well in a lot of his work. And who, what are you thinking of covering in this section? We will really look at two different attitudes uh, to nature and the climate crisis. Uh, one is that um, we are being punished for our hubris. Um, for our kind of uh, the, the runaway technology uh, and, our, and our disregard for nature and for our ecosystem. And we need to learn with, uh, to live within natural boundaries, to have more respect for the power of Gaia um, and, to, um, and to live more kind of sustainably and harmoniously with nature. And that there's a lot we can learn in this, for example, from, uh, you know, indigenous wisdom and so forth. And we need to really shift um, our model 
of, uh, of, of society, away from constant growth and innovation and technological innovation into a kind of more like inner growth uh, and, and, and living harmoniously with nature. So that's one kind of narrative one often comes across uh, in the environmental movement. On the other hand, there's this idea that the Promethean impulse in humans is what makes us kind of human and remarkable and that we need to continue to learn how to kind of conquer nature. Um, and, and that means, for, you know, finding more technological solutions. That's how we're going to go get out of the climate crisis. So finding new forms of like transport, but also expanding um, beyond planetary boundaries. So becoming an interplanetary species and that way, like reducing our existential risk. So we'll look at the works of people like Nick Bostrom uh, and the whole philosophies of existential risk, um, how to reduce them, how, how to ensure the, the long term future uh, of our species uh, and how to keep technological advances um, going. So we'll look there in like kind of transhumanism as well. The idea that um, we are constantly evolving and Homo sapiens is not the finished product. And that we can come become what Bostrom calls like um, post humans using technologies like uh, genetic editing, um, like uh, like space travel or maybe the development of AI to become uh, these kinds of uh, a new species, really. Again, you see that, that both these points of view are, are religious points of view as much as they are rational philosophies. Yeah, I mean, do you think that there's a religious underpinning to a lot of the topics that you're going to be covering? Yeah, I think that's a um, that's a theme throughout the course is looking at these new religions uh, that are uh, that that have a history and that are, and that are very strong at the moment in our culture, and learning to. Uh, consider them uh, a bit more rationally so we're less possessed by them, so we're less fused with their dogma. Um, seeing their value without necessarily taking them, you know, completely on or, uh, on board uh, and not having to see contemporary debates as kind of these black and white armies, uh, black and white wars between, on the one side, you know, the, the true and the good and the righteous and on the other side, the forces of darkness. Yeah, and I guess if people are still watching this, uh, then they might be interested in doing the course. So maybe we'll uh, cover a little bit more, let people know that we'll be, um, if you go on the course, you'll be put into a pod with other people that you can discuss the ideas with. There'll be workbooks with some of the background reading and the, um, some of the sort of, yeah, the, the, the grounding for some of the, the exercises and some of the, some of the live sessions. And what are you hoping that people will get from, from going through the experience? Um, well, first of all, cultural literacy, um, a familiarity with some of these big names that they might have heard or seen mentioned in videos or articles. And they might think, well, who is like René Girard? Um, what were Aristotle's key ideas? What were Nietzsche's key ideas? So this will give you a, an intro and a sense of this great conversation um, and how some of them fit together. So this map of ideas. Um, secondly, an epistemic flexibility. This sense of the no philosophy is perfect. Every philosopher and philosophy has strengths and flaws, and you can improve your capacity to, to spot and reflect on those strengths and flaws. Um, thirdly, I think an important aspect of this is, is just the kind of group journey. You will get to know people on the course. You will get to share fascinating ideas. It'll be as much group discussion as it is teaching. Uh, I think the great mistake people make on these courses is trying to force too much info into people's heads and not give room for discussion, for debate. And that's often people's fav you know, one of people's favorite things about these kinds of courses the people they get to interact with. Um, so there's that communal relational um, aspect to it. Um, and then yes, perhaps um, improved conversations, uh, less polarized, less uh, demonized, less black and white thinking 
and 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 more capacity to uh, to just consider arguments and 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 respectfully and consider different kind of points of view. Um, so those are some of the things. I mean, this this will be a kind of a taster in some of the the, the greatest thinkers and and best ideas. Uh, and I hope it empowers people to kind of continue that philosophical journey, just like I did in my twenties. And and you open up these people and read them the primary source and realize. What was I afraid of? This, this is this is absolutely fascinating stuff, and this is part of my heritage. Awesome, Jules. I'm really looking forward to this, and I'm fascinated to to go through it myself. I think I've got quite a few of those sort of gaps in my knowledge as well, and the the whole process does sound absolutely fascinating. I think you've done a lot of thought about what are the the really key topics, what are the most kind of salient cultural conversations, and I think. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it goes. Likewise. So this will be next, uh, or Tuesday the 16th is our, is, our, is our first session. So yeah, very much looking forward to, um, to, to, to seeing some of you there. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.